Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began with a stay of execution and ended with the death of a man's soul. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. I didn't like it. I didn't like any part of it. It's bad enough that a guy's got to die without being constantly reminded of it. Okay, so you can't live forever. I know that. But when the time comes, it should just end quick, with no warning, no anticipation, no nothing. Just like that. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not scared of the idea. That is, no more than the next guy. I just don't like it constantly tossed up in my face. That's why the managing editor could never sell me on covering the hospital beat of the city morgue. And an obituary is something that absolutely refuses to write itself out of my typewriter. That's what I was trying to tell the guy on the desk when he told me over the phone I had to go down to Joliet to cover an execution. Sure, Randy, I understand, but... No, you don't understand. He had sent somebody else. How many times I gotta tell you I got no one else? How about one of the guys on the day side? Hold him over. Impossible. What's the matter? Afraid to shell out for a little overtime? Cut it, Randy. It's late now. You're gonna have to go some to make it as it is. Now, look, Garrison, I don't want to pull rank on you. But when I took over this night beat, the managing editor assured me my assignments were completely my own. I found my own stories where I pleased. That was all through being a leg for the desk. Well, I've got news for you, Randy. Mm. When he gave me this job, he told me he was making me an executive, and all I'd have to do was sit back and tell the boys what to do. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm telling you, get down to the depot and on that train as fast as you can. The execution has got to be covered. You better hurry. There's a storm coming up. So I grabbed a cab. It was clouding up. When I got to the depot, the sky was as black as the city editor's heart. It wasn't my idea of traveling with her, but it's only a short run. We made it to Joliet before the storm broke. The train ground to a stop. It started to rain, and when I was in the taxi on the way out of the prison, it really came down. A perfect setting for the undignified event I was going to be forced to witness. I showed them my press card at the main gate, and they took me straight to the warden's office. Randy Stone, Warden, Chicago Star. Come in, Randy. Oh, I'm sorry you had to come down on a night like this. Well, I can take the storm better than the execution, I'm afraid, Warden. Oh, then you haven't heard. Heard what? Well, you should have been notified. There's been a stay. A reprieve? When? Yes, the governor ordered a stay of execution about an hour ago. His office was going to telephone the press. Oh, it's too bad you had to come all the way down. It's a great pleasure, Warden, I assure you. Come next election, I might even vote for the governor. Well, I'm pretty relieved myself. I've executed a lot of men, Randy, and I don't like it. It's be pretty tough having to kill a man, even when the law tells you you've got to. It's the toughest part of any warden's job, Randy. They're all human beings, and everyone with a story. Yeah, but not the kind I like to write. Thank you. Uh, you were uh, driving back to Chicago? No, no, I came by train. Well, there's no train for a couple of hours. You're welcome to wait here. Oh, thanks, warden. I think I'll go on into town. Maybe catch a newsreel theater for train time. No, excuse me. Sure. Hello. Yes, this is the warden. Oh, oh, Dr. Graham. Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, well, I, uh, uh... Just a minute, please. Randy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, pick up the receiver on that other phone and uh, listen to this. Okay, sure. Yes, doctor. I said I wanted to come over and visit you, warden. Well, are uh, you sure you want to come out here to the prison, doctor? Yes, warden. I feel I've got to come out there. I have to... Yes? See... Have to see it. Have to see what, doctor? Electric chair. I've got to see it. Are you sure you want to see it, doctor? Yes, I've got to. Got to. You gotta let me, Warden. But you've telephoned so many times before, doctor, and uh, then you haven't come. I couldn't. Couldn't I? But this time I'll come. Well, all right. If you feel that it's really what you want, you come ahead and I'll take you over and show you the chair. Thanks, Warden. This time I'll come. Thanks. That's all right, doctor. Goodbye. What is this? This is supposed to be some kind of a joke? I'm afraid not. Well, how morbid can a guy get calling you this time of the night so he can come out and see the electric chair? No, he won't come. He never does. You mean this goes on all the time? Whenever he's been drinking like this. But a doctor, what did you say his name was? Graham. Howard Graham. Well, it doesn't make sense. No rhyme or reason. No, he has a reason, all right. A pretty grim one. It'd have to be. Mm. 
His son was executed in the electric chair. Oh. Oh, that poor doctor. No wonder. He hasn't ever forgotten it. What did the boy do? He killed a girl. She was going to have a baby. They weren't married, and I guess he couldn't bear to disgrace his family. Oh, and so he did this to his family instead. Theodore Dreiser wrote a book once called An American Tragedy. How many times do these things have to happen before people learn? It doesn't seem they ever learn, Randy. Oh, that poor old doctor. Why does the guy go on torturing himself like that? I don't know. Maybe what psychologists call a substitution of guilt. The father feeling guilt for the crime committed by his son. Yeah, but, but why? Why? Who knows, Randy? You're the writer. You're the one that's supposed to have the answers about people. Yeah, yeah, a lot of answers I got. Uh, mind if I look this guy up? No, no, not at all. I'll give you his address. Might be a column in it. Uh, I wouldn't bother him with too many questions, Randy. It's tough enough to forget as it is. He doesn't seem to be doing too much forgetting by himself. The warden sent me into Joliet in his own car. We got to the business district. I switched to a cab and headed out to the doctor's address. If my life depended on it, I couldn't have told you why I suddenly had this intense desire to see Dr. Graham. I'd like to think it wasn't just a morbid interest in the other guy's grief, but then it wasn't in my line of duty either. Maybe my reason was as simple as the question, why? But if I'd stopped to analyze it, then I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have gone. Graham lived in one of the better residential neighborhoods, a two-story brick house looking smug and comfortable behind a wide apron of lawn. I left the cab at the curb, walked up the path to the front porch. There was a light on inside. I rang the bell, waited for somebody to answer the door. The rain had let up for a while. You ring the bell? Yes, I hope I didn't disturb you. What is it you want? Are you Mrs. Graham? She's dead. Oh, I... Killed herself. Oh, I'm sorry. Over the boy. I didn't know. I thought everyone knew. I'm the housekeeper. Well, I'm sorry to bother you. I'm a newspaper reporter, and well, I... He'll be next. You wait and see. Dr. Graham? Well, who else you think I meant? Well, I don't know, lady. I, uh... Is the uh, doctor in, please? <laughs> this time of evening? You have any idea where he might be? Where he always is. Not here. Does he have an office? Yeah, but I don't know what for. I don't have no practice left. Would you mind giving me the address? Morrison Building, downtown. But it won't do you no good. Oh, you don't think he'll be there? Yeah, more likely in the hotel next door to the Morrison building. In the bar. I see. Drinking himself to death. Well, uh, thank you. If he ain't killed himself already. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh. Hmm. And good night. I thought things like that only came out on Halloween. Oh, well. I climbed back in the cab more curious than ever about Dr. Graham and the macabre set of characters and circumstances that seemed to have been lousing up his life. There was still an hour and a half until train time, so I asked the cabbie to drive me downtown to the Morrison building. The night watchman took me up in the elevator. I walked down the dim hallway to a door marked Dr. Graham, but the housekeeper was right. The doctor wasn't in his office. The night watchman evidently expected me to be coming right back down. The elevator was still waiting at the end of the hall when I got back. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking for Dr. Graham. Yeah, figured you were. Well, he's not in. The office is dark. I could have told you that. Well, well, what did you let me come up here for? Why didn't you tell me he wasn't in? You didn't ask me. I'm one for minding my own business. They come and go, but that's when they ask me. I don't butt in. Well, I'm asking you, do you happen to know where I might find Dr. Graham? Well, you might find him at home. All right, I just came from there. The only other place would be is next door. What, in the hotel? In the bar. Oh, swell, swell. Would you mind taking me down? Sure thing. You seem to know the doctor pretty well. Mm, oh, so. You know his son, too? The one that, uh, had the trouble? He got the electric chair. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you know him? That's right. That's what? Knew the girl, too. The one was killed. You did? Yeah, oh, one of the old doc's patients. Rode her up in the elevator quite a few times. Doc is, uh, not doing too well these days, I hear. No, kind of gone out of practice, you might say, since the trouble. Uh huh. Mm. Oh, thank you. I think I'll try and find him next door. By the way, what does the doctor look like? Uh, don't you know him? No, no, that is, I've only talked to him on the telephone. Oh, well, he be at the bar. He's a kind of middle aged man. Uh, heavy shit. It looks like a doctor. You'll know him, all right. I'm sure I will. Yeah. 
I went back out to the street and told the cab driver not to wait. Then I went next door to the hotel, walked through the half-empty lobby and into the bar. Just like the watchman said, I didn't have a bit of trouble spotting Dr. Graham. He was the only customer in the place, sitting on a high stool at the far end of the bar. I climbed up alongside him and motioned to the bartender who had his ear in the jukebox. Hey, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's it gonna be? Uh, make it a gimlet. Uh, that's, uh... Gimlet? Yeah, you know, it's, uh... It's in a martini glass. Of course I know. You're trying to tell me how to run my business? <laughs> no, no, certainly not. I just didn't know if you understood. Seventeen years. I've been mixing drinks in the finest place. Now, look, it's... fella, now, don't get me wrong. Shaved ice, dry gin, little sugar, lemon peel, and lime juice. That's right. That's right. There's no way. Only. Lime juice got to be imported. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. We ain't got it. Not imported. Well, that's all right. Just make it a martini, then. In taste, you can't tell the difference if lime juice is imported or regular. So I make you a gimlet. That's what you order, huh? <laughs> sure, sure. Make it any way you like. Import it regular. What's the difference? Nobody ever complains before. I'm not complaining. Look, what's the matter with everybody in this town? Everybody I meet tonight gives me double talk. All I want is a drink. I don't care what you bring me. Bring the gentleman what he wants, bud. Okay, doctor. <laughs> well, thank you, doctor. That's all. Yeah, I can really use a drink tonight. I'm a little on the jumpy side. Mm, nerves can be a treacherous thing. No, it's, uh, it's more than that. I've been over to the state prison. Tonight? Yes, I came down to witness an execution. In the electric chair? It was called off. There was a stay of execution. I've seen many men die. I, I'm a doctor, you know. Yes, I know. But I've never seen a man die in the electric chair. Well, it's pretty rough. Have you ever seen the electric chair? Uh, yeah. Would you mind very much describing it to me? Well, I'd rather not, doctor. See, I, I know who you are. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Gray. Yes, my name is Randy One Stone. One gimlet, just like you order. Okay, thank you very much. As I was saying... Aren't you going to taste it? Well, sure, sure, later. Well, maybe you don't like it. Well, sure, I like it. Here, if it'll make you happy. Oh, yes, it's fine. It's just fine. Sure, I told you. I'll call you when I'm ready for another one. Seventeen years. I'm mixing drinks. He tries to tell me how to make a kiss. As I was saying, Doc, you know, I know who you are. I was in the warden's office tonight when you telephoned. Warden's office? Yeah. I'm a newspaper man. It's only fair that you know, because I want to ask you a couple of questions. What kind of questions? They're rather personal. Well? For one thing, why do you keep on telephoning the warden? Didn't he tell you? Yeah, he told me. Because I want to see the electric chair. Now, look, Doc, that's not going to help. You know it isn't. I know I'll never be able to go and see it, but I've got to call him. It's a compulsion. I drink and I telephone him and then I drink some more. It's kind of a circle. But don't you realize you'll never forget that way? You're just torturing yourself. No, no, I... Down deep, I... I know why I call him. But uh, it's a secret. Nobody's supposed to know. You see, I... I'm the one that's guilty. It should have been me who died in an electric chair. Look, Doc, I know how you feel, but you got it all wrong. A father can't go on being responsible for the sins of his son. Even in the Bible, it's the other way around. Try to bring up your kids the best way you know how, but after they reach a certain point, there's nothing you can do. You did your best, it just didn't work out. No, no, you don't understand. It was my child. I'm the one who's guilty. I'm the one who should have paid. That's why I telephoned the warden. That's why I got to see the electric chair. <laughs> NBC is bringing you Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. By the time the bartender got through proving to me that he really knew his business, it got to be kind of late and just a little wet out, so I missed my train. As the evening grew more and more confused, so did Dr. Graham. Somehow, after talking to him, I didn't feel quite so sorry for him. He he seemed to be enjoying his strange fixation on the electric chair. It was different from just a father's grief. The guy seemed to be going off his rocker. I vaguely remember pouring him into a cab after the bar closed and then checking into the hotel for the night. When I woke up, the sun was beating through the window. I put in a call to Chicago and got the paper on the phone. 
afternoon, the star. Afternoon? Honey, is it that late? I beg your pardon? What time is it? Oh, one moment, please. I'll give you our information, sir. No, wait a minute, honey. It's Randy Stone. Oh, Randy, why didn't you say so? Gee, everybody's been calling for you all morning. Oh, fine, fine. Give me the desk, hmm? Just a second, Randy. I'm ringing. Thank you. City desk. How are you, Phil? Randy Stone. Randy, for the love of Mike, where have you been? In Joliet, where you sent me last night, remember? I know, but that was last night. Where are you now? In Joliet. But the execution was called off. Why didn't you come back? I had to stay over. There was a storm. Oh, rats. The trains were running. Well, maybe next time you won't send me out of town on an assignment I didn't want in the first place. All right, all right. When are you coming back? As soon as I can get dressed and catch a train. Get dressed? At this time of day? I work the night beat, remember? When you day side lads are catching up on your beauty sleep, I'm working. Yeah, just exactly what kind of work were you up to last night, Stone? Or does that come under the heading of personal? Personal, my eye was following up a contact, the human interest you're on, the warden touted me on. And? Well, it fizzled out, that's all. Uh, there was a doctor here whose son was executed last year for murder. That's nice. Be sure and check in at the office when you get back. Okay, I'll see you later, Phil. Hey, Phil, <laughs> you worry too much. Goodbye. <laughs> That guy's going to get himself a nose. Yeah. Mr. Stone. Talking. This is Dr. Graham. I met you in the bar last night. Do you remember? Oh, certainly. How are you, Doctor? I wasn't sure whether you were still in the city. Well, I kind of overslept. By the way, how did you know I was staying over at the hotel? Well, you mentioned that you were going to last night before I left you. I didn't think you'd remember. You were feeling no pain when I put you in the cab, Doc. I always remember everything. That's my difficulty. Well, uh, what can I do for you, Doctor? I said a lot of foolish things last night. No, I don't think so. It was the alcohol talking, not me. Well, maybe the alcohol just made it a little easier for your heart to put it in words. Did you believe the things I said? Well, yes, certainly. Everything? Of course. I just didn't approve of everything. I was hoping you wouldn't remember. Well, fortunately, I do. Yes. Unfortunately. I'm sorry, Doctor. It isn't good to remember some things. They cause such unhappiness. What are you trying to say, Doctor? I shouldn't want them to bring you unhappiness. That would be such a pity. You'd be better off dead. What the... Hello. Hello, Doctor. Operator. Oh, is this the outside operator? No, this is the hotel operator. Can I help you? I was just talking with somebody and I was cut off. Can you connect me again? I'm sorry, sir, but that was an outside call and your party is disconnected. If you have the number, I will be glad to call it for you. No, no, thank you. No, thanks very much. Never mind. I have an idea my party hung up. <laughs> After that choice bit of dialogue, and before breakfast, mind you, I was convinced that the telephone, like the noble horse, had outlived its usefulness. I took a fast shower and climbed into yesterday's clothes and then stopped off at the barber shop in the lobby to get rid of the stubble on my chin. It was now after two o'clock. I could either have breakfast or stop at the bar to take care of the butterflies that seemed to be nesting in my stomach. The butterflies won out. My bartender friend of last night was back on duty listening to the same tired old recording. Yeah, yeah. What's it going to be? Ah, oh, hello. Uh, the doc around? No, no. A little early for him. What's it going to be? Gimlet? No, I don't think so. But you were drinking gimlets last night? Yeah, I know. You don't like them? Well, not today. Uh, thank you. I'll try, uh, try a stinger. You didn't like the lime juice because it wasn't imported. I loved it. I loved it. I just happened to want a stinger today. Something to settle my stomach. But stinger tastes like licorice. I know. It's the, uh, anisette in the brand. Well, licorice is not good for the stomach. Maybe something with bitters. Oh, no, no. Not again. Look, just forget the whole thing. Forget I ever came in here. What's the matter? Are you mad? No, I changed my mind. I'm in no mood for another basic course in bartending. I think I'll have breakfast instead. With a little tomato juice and coffee under my belt, I felt some better. But not nearly so good as I would when I got out of this town and back to my own. I seem to be living upside down on a Ferris wheel ever since I got on that train yesterday afternoon. Or maybe it was just my subconscious still fighting against my undue familiarity with the general subject of death. Oh, I shook that ugly word out of my mind. After settling up with the cashier and checking the desk clerk about my train time, I made my formal exit from the hotel. The fresh air and the bustle of traffic picked me up, and I started walking in the general direction of the train station. There was a dark blue sedan parked in front of the hotel and started up just as I swung out of the lobby, but I didn't pay any attention to it. Not until I got to the corner, that is, and started to cross the street. The car had been inching along behind me. 
And just as I stepped out into the intersection, its engine roared and the car came straight at me. This was no accident. The car didn't stop. Whoever it was had deliberately tried to run me down. I got a fleeting glimpse of the rear of a blue sedan as it sped down the street. I couldn't make out the license number. But right above it was one of those little green crosses, a doctor's cross. Dr. Graham, it must be. And he tried to kill me. I wasn't hurt, but I was mad. I couldn't believe that I'd almost been killed. It didn't make any sense. I couldn't figure out why Dr. Graham or anyone for that matter would want to kill me. Unless the poor guy was really unhinged and he resented my putting my nose into his affairs. But that'd make him more than just psycho. It would make him homicidal. And that was something I just couldn't walk away from now. I brushed some of the street off the seat of my pants and headed back to the hotel bar. There was a question or two I wanted to ask the fancy drink mixer. Well, you back again, huh? Yeah, same guy. Uh, how about turning off that tune, huh? What's the matter? Don't you like it? <laughs> I like it, but I've heard it before. Huh? Okay, okay. Gimlet? Uh, yeah, make it double. Okay, double gimlet. You see? I don't give you no argument. Mm -hmm. You say double, I give you double. Thank you, thank you. Say, has Dr. Graham been in here in the last hour since I was in before? Sure. You didn't see him? No. I told him he was looking for him. Well, I checked out of the hotel. Yeah, he was asking about you. He was asking about me? Now, what do you want to know? Well, just if you ask me anything about him. Oh, I see. How long have you known the doc? Oh, I don't know. He comes here. Has he been coming here long? Oh, mostly since the boy was... You know. Yeah, I see. Uh, before that? Once in a while. Never drinks much before. He come here with his son? No, no. He come in sometimes with a girl, though. What girl? His patient. The girl the boy killed. They had a big argument in here one night. With the doctor and the girl? That's right. The doc kept saying he would kill his wife if she found out. Found out what? I don't know. Just if she found out. But the boy, I guess. Uh, about the boy or about himself? About the boy, of course. And last night, why did he say the child is mine? I'm the one that's killing you. What are you talking about? Are you crazy? Now, sure, I must be crazy. Couldn't be true. So why would the doctor try to kill me? Who tried to kill you? When? Never mind, never mind. Tell me. Have you ever seen Dr. Graham's car? Sure, lots of times. What kind is it? Sedan. What kind of sedan? Blue sedan. Why? Now, where's your phone? Booth in the corner. Thank you. Graham, 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 Gates, Gates, Gordian, Gordian. Oh, great. Albert, Charles, David, Elmer, Frederick, Howard, Howard, Graham, physician, residence. Uh, Hello? Dr. Graham there? He ain't in. You know where I can reach him? It's urgent. He's at his office. Are you sure it's terribly important? I said he's at his office. I just talked with him there. Uh-huh. You the man he was expecting? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, I guess I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I knew it. Dr. Graham was a murderer. He was literally guilty, not just a substitution guilt. And last night he told me more than he wanted to. Sure, that's why he'd asked me on the phone if I'd believed him. He was as guilty as he could be. But of what crime? Once again, I took the elevator up to Dr. Graham's office, and this time he was in. I opened the door and walked into the reception room. Another door marked private was standing open. Inside, the doctor was waiting for me, seated at his desk, a small black revolver in his shaking hand. Come in. Well, I see you're expecting me, doctor. Yes, expecting you. Close the door. Certainly. You know, don't you? Oh, yes. I, I know, but I can't understand it. I can't understand how any human being could possibly do such a thing. You know, but you'll never tell. Because I'm going to kill you. Oh, no, you won't, Doctor. Because you're afraid. You're a coward, Dr. Graham. You're afraid if you kill me, you'll be caught. Wouldn't be anyone left to blame it on this time. 
Wasn't your son. It was you who killed that girl, wasn't it? You know. She wasn't the boy's girlfriend at all. She was yours. Isn't that so, Doctor? Don't say that. An affair with one of your patients and you were afraid your wife would found out. Wasn't that it? You would have killed her. Well, what about this? Didn't this kill her? And your boy, your own son. I don't see how no, anyone... No, no. It was his idea. He wanted to take the blame so his mother would never find out. Find out. He would have killed her. He knew that. This way, it wouldn't be so hard on her, he said. The good lawyer could fix things so that he wouldn't have... so that he wouldn't have to... Die in the electric chair? The electric chair. <laughs> now you know why I had to see. Why I had to keep telephone. Why I could never go and see You're right, Mr. Stone. I'm a coward. Well, that's why you're not going to kill me now. You're afraid. You know you're safe as long as I don't tell. And I won't tell, Dr. Graham. The police will never know. You'll never go to trial and you'll never be sentenced. You'll never see the electric chair, Doctor. (laughs) Every hour of every day you'll pay for your crime. You'll die again and again and again. God pity you. Well, here I sit doing the one thing I swore I'd never do. Writing an obituary instead of a story. Dr. Howard Graham, age 51, died from heart attack following confession of murder. Let me see, what day is this? Monday... August 21st, 1950. Contributing cause, death of son, death of wife, and of his own soul. Yep. But who are we to judge? As it says in the book, leave him to heaven. Copy, boy. Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy, is produced and directed by Warren Lewis and edited by Larry Marcus. Tonight's story was written by Warren Lewis with music by Frank Worth. The part of the doctor was played by Bill Johnstone. Others in tonight's cast were Ted Von Elks, Irene Tedrow, Wilms Herbert, Jay Novello, and Inga Yolas. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Three Secrets, released by Warner Brothers. Listen next week at this time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. Nightbeat came to you from Hollywood. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Two stellar chime stars will be back on NBC very soon. Beginning Tuesday, September 19th, that master clown Art Linkletter comes back to prove that people are funny. And Fanny Bryce returns as Baby Snooks in seven weeks to add to NBC's Top Tuesday of Chime Stars. Listen now for the first piano quartet on NBC.